Welcome to a state of minds, Screamer Celica, with a Celtic state of mind. I'm Paul John Dykes. Once again, I'm joined by Kevin Graham. Kevin, welcome to a state of mind studios. Are you still enjoying your surroundings? Oh, definitely. It's been a fantastic afternoon. Um, just the vibe in the place. I said to you earlier, it's like being inside your head, which I never thought would want to see inside your head. A visual interpretation a, a visual of what goes on. A interpretation of what I reckon that you see on a daily basis. I think that's not a bad way to describe it. Now, Kevin, before he came in, I'd done the same with John Calhoun. When he came in as the first guest, I asked him to look at the wall of vinyl that we've got outside the studio and pick a record from that wall of vinyl. He spent some time looking at it. What was the record you chose? The Source the Candy Stanton. And Good choice. I, I feel the love. Yeah, brilliant. Um, there's only... Disco records, techno records, house records, whatever you want to call them, I think there's three staples, three great ones. Donna Summer, I feel love. What a tune. Absolutely. Best disco tune ever. Delight, Groove is in the Heart, Unremixable, Bootsy Collins' bass on that is just out of this world, and the source featuring Candy Stanton. We've uh, mentioned a few female vocalists there and would like to dedicate this particular episode yes. to the brilliance, the genius uh, that has left us over the last 24 hours, um, quite shockingly young. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll allow you to, to pay tribute to the great Denise Johnson. Yes, it was a bit of a shock yesterday when the, the news came through. I mean, my early 90s listening experience wouldn't be the same if it, Denise's vocals on the Primal Scream records. Um, only only last year they've really released the, well, it's a new album, the Memphis Tapes. We've spoke about it a number of times here. Eh? And our vocal performance on free on that Memphis Tapes is unbelievable. And... She worked with New Order, A Certain Ratio, numerous other bands. She was a well-known face in the Manchester music scene. And she was very, I never knew her, never met her, but we had a couple of Twitter conversations, eh, which people seem to think now means that you knew a person. Eh, but we had a couple of Twitter conversations about Robert Young, eh, the Primal Scream guitarist who obviously passed away a number of years ago and it's, it's quite poignant that now you've got Robert up there, Denise and Andrew Weatherall as well, who were all a major part of an album that changed my life and the, the, the outpouring of love for Denise shows you how well that she was respected and what a talent, what a fabulous voice, eh, what a Seemingly, genuinely, very, very nice person. And I think Screamer Celica should be dedicated to her um, today and possibly in the future as well because she seemed like such a great soul. Absolutely. A massive part of that fantastic album that we celebrate every time we, we do an episode of Screamer Celica. Uh, Kevin, you've got it tattooed on your arm. I'm not going to ask you to show the viewers oh, at home. No. This is... <laughs> Um, a very early version of a Celtic State of Mind live streaming. We're going to be doing it a lot more often when we're in the studio and we'll get used to the technology as well, so that'll improve as, as time goes on, but the podcast itself will still go out in all the usual places over the next couple of days, so please enjoy the live streaming that we do from State of Mind Studios. We're going to be speaking about an album that played a big part in Kev Kevin's life and when it was released, happened in the world of Celtic at that time. So, Kevin, what album are we going to be speaking about this week? We're going to be speaking about The Stone Roses, The Stone Roses, which was released on the 4th of May, 1989. Um, an album, it changed everything for me. An album, it changed my life. The first moment that I actually heard the guitar so the opening guitar notes of made of stone like the descending gu guitar notes it was like an angel coming down a set of stairs it was a fantastic everything obviously i'd listened to music before that but everything that i've listened to since then that was year zero that was influenced opened my mind 
to a whole lot of possibilities. Even with, when I'm listening to Mogwai, a minimal, minimalist techno, jazz, mod music, northern soul, all comes from that moment I heard those descending guitar notes. Made of Stone, you've already mentioned it, so let's talk a wee bit more about that particular song, Kevin. Um, I remember reading a review where the bands were spoken about as being uh, quite individual in their sound, but I think when you, you sound, when you listen to the, the Stone Roses album, there are some influences, and I think Made of Stone certainly um, is influenced by Primal Scream's Velocity Girl, just to bring Primal Scream back into the conversation, and Painted Black by the Rolling Stones. Um when you listen to the Stone Roses album, can you hear any other influences in those remarkable songs on that debut LP? It's quite weird because when you're looking back, it gets Acid House, The Hacienda, Madchester. It gets, that's what it's labelled as. But it's really the influences on that album for me is the Beatles, the Birds. There's a bit of Northern Soul. It's a um, Jimi Hendrix. There's Hendrix there as well. It's an al a rock album that touches on staples of rock music, but it was the attitude that was done with. Mm -hmm. It was the, the vibe that came off the four guys who actually made that music. I must admit, I remember my dad. Um, I had all my dad's LPs, but I never listened to them. They were sitting in my room, and I looked at the front covers, every so often and like I always remember the love front cover jumping out at me but I never listened to it and he came up one day and he went who's that that you're listening to and I went, it's the Stone Roses he went they sound like the birds I went all right he says hold on the now and he went through the albums and put out a birds album so for that for that moment I listened to the birds that led to Crosby Stills and Nash and Young Neil Young Buffalo Springfield Love that's what I'm saying that was year zero and all it took was my dad going, wait a minute, that sounds like the birds. I'd never heard of the birds before. And Talking of birds, um, Pretty Flamingo. Pretty Flamingo by Manfred Mann. What I love about that song is, listen to it, it is a song for my sugar spun sister, the intro, uh, but it was also a favourite of the Lisbon Lions. Um, when throughout that season, I think Bobby Lennox was a big fan and I think uh, Jimmy Johnson was a big fan a pretty flamingo and it was an interesting discovery for me when I was speaking to Phil Differ and John McLaverty on a quite an early episode of A Celtic State Remember of Mind well, eh? and I asked them to give me a song and John McLaverty gave me Pretty Flamingo and I've got to say I'm embarrassed to say it now I wasn't familiar with the song it's all about points of reference and I hadn't gone as, and listened to Manfred Mann all that much and when I listened to it I thought nah it's a song for my sugar spoon sister and uh, you know, it shattered a wee bit of an illusion for me because I always remember that review about this work being all their own stuff. But obviously, they're going to be lending their ear to quite a lot of other influences. And I think where bands go wrong, Kevin, is if they're influenced by the Roses, they can't try and sound like the Roses because they just sound like a cheap rip-off of the Stone Roses. What they need to do is they need to go further back and listen to the influences that the Stone Roses had in order to have any of the kind of elements or the ingredients of that tremendous album that was released. You mentioned uh, about... Uh, Hendrix, and I know that obviously Squire was influenced by Hendrix, but he's more of a, a jangly gu guitar player. You know, that crystalline pop that we keep hearing that, the hushed vocals of Ian Brown. And what I love about the album as well is that they assassinate the Queen halfway through it. You can even hear the gunfire, you know, in Elizabeth, my dear. So they had my, they had my vote straight away, even though back in the day, and it was an interview I spoke to you uh, this week about, Ian Brown admitted to having a Union Jack tattooed on his arm when he was 15 year old uh, what did he call it pissed up and foolish right, that's right. and you see him on the video I love like a fountain mm -hmm. when he's driving the motor and he's got a new tattoo tattooed over the Union Jack isn't he thankfully I think it's a big dragon I think that was probably more to do when he was a scooter boy eh? that, that the late 70s early 80s skinhead look the, the, the Union Jacks were were in vogue at that point eh yeah, he's realised the error of his ways and he's had it tattooed over as well. Um, hopefully he'll realise the error of his current uh, hair as well and get that cut. But this is an album, there's a few things about this album that, you know, facts that you know uh, instantly that you probably don't know about a lot of albums. Who produced it? John Lennon. 
John Lecky. And when you look at what they tried to do up to the point of Lecky coming in, they went with Martin Hannett, who had produced so many Manchester bands up to that point, famously uh, Joy Division and New Order. Uh, so they actually recorded a whole album with Martin Hannett. I don't know if it's something you've invested in. It was uh, Garage Flower. It eventually came out as Garage Flower, uh, but it was a lot kind of punkier, a bit heavier. But there were versions, early versions of I Want to Be Adored and I Am the Resurrection on it. But it's an album that was never released. Uh, is that an album that you've invested in at all? I do. Uh, I have listened to the album, but it's no one that I invested a lot of time in. Um, when you do hear the early Stone Rosie stuff, because you're, the band were going for 83, 84, maybe even before that. And I reckon the Stone Roses, as we know it, only really started when Manny joined. And why did Manny join? Another guest who was on the podcast had a big part to play in Manny joining the Stone Roses, Clint Boone. Clint Boone. Uh, so I reckon Manny gave them the funk, gave them the, the change of direction. We've all heard the early versions, I Want to Be Adored, I Am The Resurrection, but you listen to Manny's bass playing. You're talking about it sounded kind of punk. Manny's bass never sounds punk, even when he was doing the Primal Scream stuff, which was quite punk. There was always a soulful fun funkiness, a looseness to Manny's bass playing. The loosest Manny bass playing was the gig that, that Andrew Innes told us about when he was playing for Primal Scream at the Glasgow Barrowlands. Now, we've since found out more information about that particular <laughs> evening. And uh, it got to the point where Andrew Innes had to pull the bass out the amp because Manny was playing the wrong song. And the reason he was playing the wrong song was because of the Beards Bar. And he had visited the Beards Bar at some point during the afternoon of the gig. All afternoon. And whatever transpired meant that he was so legless he didn't even know the song that he was meant to be playing. And the following week, Celtic View, Manny gets interviewed and he gives the Beards Bar and its proprietor a big shout out because he says it's a favourite place to visit in Glasgow after Celtic Park. I know, eh, Beards, it's no, there, no longer there, obviously. Talk to us about the Beards, the legacy of Beards Bar. Oh, I used to love going to Beards. It used to be part of your Barrowlands ritual. Was it more of a, a music ritual for you than a football ritual? Music. Yeah. Music ritual. Obviously, I was getting the supporters bus in for Stirling. So we would always come in the other side. So we were never down the Gallagate and we were always up the other end of the London Road. But it was always a music ritual. If you were going to the Barrowlands, you had to go into Beards. And you had to take your Ranger supporting pals into Beards. Mm -hmm. And even they were a agog with the merchandise, the, the memorabilia. What do you remember of the wall? Uh, merchandise and the, the you know all that memorabilia up on the on the walls. My what mind, one thing? My mind might be playing tricks on me here, but the Break Club banner. Yep, that's up there. Was that on the ceiling? If I remember, I, I think correctly. it was hanging from the ceiling. Yeah, hanging. Mm -hmm. I always remember. I always remember being utterly fascinated by the Break Club banner. The JFK portrait behind the bar. Yep. Now this is this is another Manchester story, but I went to see Doves at the Barrowlands, mm -hmm. and me and my wife Denise were sitting having a drink. When was it? Sorry to interrupt. When was it? What, what album? Last broadcast. I might have been at that gig. So I gave Jimmy Goodwin a Celtic pin badge. Let's not talk about Celtic pin badges, but <laughs> it was at a time where, you know, you used to buy them outside the ground, a wee Celtic pin badge, and I, I managed to get it to Jimmy Goodwin that night. Well, we were sitting in Beards having a drink. Uh, we were up early. For some bizarre reason, we were there early. And we were sitting in beers having a drink. And it was quite interesting to see the comings and goings of the people in beers. I don't know what they were getting from. I don't know what they were selling or what they were getting. Drink. Drink, aye, drink. But Jimmy was sitting in the table next to us. And I remember him having a laugh at the JFK picture. Really? Aye. Uh, because I'm sure there was, a, there was a picture alongside it. And I'm going to be completely wrong here. I'm sure there was a picture of some mafia mobster next to him. And and he was laughing at the, the contradiction of, of the of the two pictures. Because a roadie came in to get him to say sound check or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And and I, and I remember Jimmy Goodwin pointing them out to the roadie going, that's weird. <laughs> that, that's. It was a place where bands, it was part of the pilgrimage to Glasgow. If you were going to the Barrowlands, then they would visit. Uh, the Beards, so many celebrities and superstars have gone maybe a wee bit early for the revellers going to the gig to Beards Bar and it's everybody from Shane McGowan to 
Mick Hucknell, you know, Supergrass were in there. We were all in there, Kevin. It's a legendary pub and it's a shame that we don't still have the beards because it was authentic. You can open a pub anywhere, call it a Celtic bar, right? Put some nice things up on the wall, normally framed signed jerseys. But this was authentic. I mean, their pictures were nicotine stained up there. That's how old they had been up there, you know? So the beards bar, it was there for some time beforehand, but it became what you would maybe term a Celtic bar in 1989. That's when a Celtic... Stuff started going up in the walls in 1989. And it just created a legendary status for itself. And it's one that I always look back fondly on, uh, the Beards Bar. But you're talking about taking Rangers fans in there. You know, there was one, and I'm not going to name him, but there was one famous front man of a Manchester band who was ejected at the Beards Bar for wearing a Manchester United top. That's all I'm saying. So anyway, the Beards Bar, legendary um, next door to the, the Barrowlands. But let's get back to the Stone Roses' first album because Manny took us down the, the wrong road there, which I'm sure, he's done, I'm sure he's done that to a few people. So John Leckie, he had famously worked with uh, bands like The Fall, The Laz, The Cult, The Human League, various different bands, different genres. How important was he to the sound of that debut album? You've got to say that he shaped it when you hear the earlier demos. Uh, you've got to say that, that he shaped the, the sound that we grew to love, that jangly. What, what's new? What's now probably described as classic indie mm-hmm. sound, that jangly guitar. But as you say, there was influence before that. You listen to a lot of the C86 bands that the Primal Scream wear, Dane Velocity Girl and stuff like that. That jangly pop's always been there. The Bird's influence has always been there. I think Lecky maybe just harness the vibe of the band, mm-hmm. harness the vibe of 88 going into 89, the the hope, the carefree attitude, the, the political mind of the band as well. Absolutely. I mean, because I, 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 I'm, I could be wrong here, but I'm sure Made of Stone and Sugar Spun Sister were written in the studio, were one of the, were the last songs uh, maybe recorded during those sessions because I'd watched a documentary on Channel 4 about the Parisian riots. Um, so I think Lecky done well to harness the nightclub vibe that the band were maybe living, enjoying, living and, living and enjoying at that time. Eh? So maybe the chemical mind that the band were um, enjoying at that, might, that time as well. Eh? Uh, but Lecky, I mean, that, that made Lecky's career really. It did, but probably I mean, wrongly. Maybe, maybe that's just my lack of knowledge. No, I think I think he was fairly established, obviously, uh, uh, pr- previous to the debut album, Kevin. But since then, you know, he would be a go-to, and he was a go-to for the Stone Roses. Uh, you know, when they they attempted to make their second album, their recording sessions broke down, and they had to go elsewhere to get the the album finished. But John Lecky for me was very important. But one thing he got wrong was "Don't Stop." They don't stop. Everybody knows it's waterfall played backwards, and that was certainly a studio trick, a studio song. Um, and what I've mentioned before is that Ian Brown did listen to songs backwards because he found that a lot of melodies would come out with the backwards music, and he was able to then fit melodies into other songs. But that was a song that John Lecky was not a fan of, and he wanted to remove it from the album. When you look at the Made of Stone rehearsal footage, the documentary that was made by Shane Meadows. And they play Don't Stop Live. It's a beautiful moment. The chemistry between the four guys in that room is quite incredible. Was John Leckie wrong to try and get it removed? Oh, it depends what else was recorded at that time. I mean, you look at some of the B-sides, what the world was waiting for, where angels play, Mersey Paradise. But what are you looking for in an album? I, a loving pop I know, songs? I know, I, I, I can a bit of balance? But we're back at a bit of psychedelia? Uh, yes, definitely. Yeah. And the album needed that wee bit of psychedelia, I think, because there was that, there was a love influence there, there, there was. So I'm sure you, know, you have to go with the artist on that. Eh? Now, I, I, but I'm sure John Lecky, who are we to argue with John Lecky to actually say, by the way, I don't think that's going to work. No. I mean, there's a lot of the albums that we can talk about that sometimes you wish the producer had says, by the way, that's rotten. That's not that's no going on the album, eh? But when you look when you look at the album for a whole from start to finish, from a door to resurrection, it flows. There's a perfect break when vinyl 
where it, where it does break on the vinyl. It's a perfect flow and don't stop. It does fit. I, I couldn't imagine an album without it now, but I can imagine definitely maybe without Diggsy's Diner. Well, I think if Lecky had been going for that perfect pop album, then one of the songs you mentioned, for example, Where Angels Play, that ended up on a B-side, could easily have slotted in there. But I just think there's there's certain moments of that album, like Elizabeth, My Dear, and like Don't Stop, that are almost anomalies. You know, it's you look at the, the very first song, it opens with I Want to Be Adored. So when you look at, for example, the the um, the Bible, the biblical references of the Stone Roses throughout their career. But that very first song is the adoration and then it finishes with I Am The Resurrection. Um, so that that's like the first chapter of the Old Testament. That's like the Old Testament, not the first chapter. The first chapter of the Stone Roses, hence the second coming being uh, referred to on the second album. But if you were to maybe remove Don't Stop Elizabeth, My Dear, and put two pop songs in it, it's not the same album. No, definitely not. And that, that's what I'm, that's maybe the point I was making a bit badly there, eh? that I can't imagine the album if Elizabeth, my dear, and don't stop on it. I can imagine other albums that I completely love with other songs uh, on it, on them. But I can't imagine, because it's a perfect work of art. Oh, yeah. They start to finish. Yep. And it's one of these work, works of art which is wasn't loved when it first came out. No. And it's over generations its true worth has actually came to the fore. What did the NME, the NME give it? Was it a six or a seven? I'm going to say a seven. I, I can't imagine it was given a six, but it certainly wasn't a rave review. It wasn't a nine but out the end, of ten. But by the end of the years, it was top of the list. Top of the list. Yeah. Because I, I reckon a lot of that had to do with the famous Stuart McConey interview mm -hmm. where he spent three days with him, I think, in Switzerland. And all they did was listen to the birds' house music in Northern Soul. And I think that was the vibe that you get for the album, even though its its touchstones are basically 60s psychedelia and pop. What do you think of this quote from Ed Potton? One of the most once-in-a-generation moments when the musical stars align, killer songs, iconic artwork, and a band at the top of their zeitgeist surfing game. Can't argue with it. You can't argue with it. The Stone Roses were, it was maybe just an age thing. But the Stone Roses looked perfect. I remember the first time seeing them and all that. Wow. I also remember thinking I would never be able to look like that. Never even made an attempt to look like Ian Brown because he was just too cool. He was just. But too... he wasn't a young kid. I mean, when that I album know, came no, out, he was 26, 27 year old. You know? I, I know. You looked at Squire. You could tell that there were four individuals, mm -hmm. but together they were. They just blended really, really well together. And when you look at the the comeback, if you can call it the comeback or whatever it is, the, the FUD coming or whatever, you want you want to obviously there was a bit of tension towards the end, but you could tell that they four guys were one of the stone roses without they four guys. They would never have carried on. They would never have got back together, together as the Stone Roses if it wasn't the four members who were the Stone Roses. And you could tell that when whatever's happened, happened. And, I mean, let's no beat about the bush here, eh? I wasn't bored that they didn't release any more music. Were you not? No. No, I wanted them to release an album. I wasn't bothered. I wanted an album out of them. I think they, they came back and done what they wanted done what they needed to do. They, they came back and, and What, made loads of money? I've got... I've, I've, got, I've I, not got a problem with that. I've got no problem But I wanted, whatsoever. I wanted a third album. I've got no problem with them whatsoever coming back and getting what they were due. Mm -hmm. Oh, no exactly, because they've been ripped off yeah. through bad management, terrible record deals, everybody knows the story, taken to court, etc. They've been... And then what then happened was the wheels came off. So when they went into the recording studio, you know, the relationship, the chemistry, it's all different. And they had a clutch of songs, which the aforementioned John Leckie worked on. And unsurprisingly, it's the popular kind of tracks like 10 Story Love Song that Leckie uh, was working on. The later ones got darker. Actually, we could do, and hopefully we will do, a Scheme of Cellar concert and coming at some stage, because I love that album. album. It's a superb album. But I think it took a while for people to get over the fact that it didn't sound quite like the Stone Roses of 
six years, five years previously. But how? Why would it? Did Fool's Gold sound like nothing the like band, it? Sound like the band that we heard on that album? Nothing no. like it. Did One Love sound like the band that we had heard on that album? No. No. So they anyway, were already moving in other directions by that stage. Right. They did release new stuff. They released two songs. Beautiful, beautiful thing. Right. Superb. Yeah, I love it. Absolutely. Love it. Gorgeous. Absolutely. I'm not too keen on All For One. Works live. For me, it worked live anyway, rather than the... Did it work for any live, though? Beautiful thing didn't, obviously, because I never played it. Uh, and that, that, again, was part of the conversation that we had with Andrew Innes talking about the reasons for a lot of the rifts. Um, but, you know, sometimes with genius, Kevin, you've got to take the foibles, you know? And you talk about that with footballers, musicians, artists... And uh, you're going to get greatness out of them, but sometimes you've got to put up with other issues in terms of maybe relationships between them and other members of the band. You go, you go back to that Made a Stone documentary, and I think there's an early interview with Rennie in it, or is it Ian Brown talking? And Rennie says to him in 1992, you're going to be the biggest band on the planet. I'm not into that. But he, for me, when you watch particularly the, a lot of the live footage, since they came back, obviously, is just yeah. astonishing. But the rehearsal footage. Now, somewhere somewhere in a box is that whole session. So there'll be a full set of that rehearsal footage somewhere in Shane, Shane Meadows' Shane, garage. Shane Meadows is watching that on a <laughs> daily basis, <laughs> probably. Because there's a chalkboard behind Ian Brown with a set list on it. If Shane Meadows wants to come on, state of <laughs> exactly. mind, we'll talk and bring to the him tape. and bring the tape with him. We'll be more than happy. Because the two tracks, Waterfall and Don't Stop, that... That we've seen, we've seen them on uh, YouTube, obviously. I mean, I watch them all the time. Uh, the chemistry between the four of them is astonishing. But Rennie, Rennie's on a different level, oh, Kevin. Definitely, definitely. Even his backing vocals. He doesn't get enough credit for the, the backing vocals. And even on the Life of Blackpool DVD, he doesn't get the credit. He could sing. Oh, aye. And even when I saw them live, at the, the especially at Glasgow Green, it was the, the back and forth. This was the second time round, though, eh? Glasgow Green. Uh, Glasgow Green, the second the, time. The reformation. The back, the back and forward between Brown and many vocals, they dovetailed perfectly. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just one of these, it's a bit like the Beatles, eh? Will you ever get another Beatles just because of the chemistry of the four folk yeah. that are there? Mm -hmm. You cannot talk about Oasis, but if you didn't have the Stone Roses, you wouldn't have got Oasis. And who are Oasis? What is the... What is the it's top, a it's the Gallagher brothers? What's the top Oasis right. lineup? If Oasis were to reform, what five well, guys would you want to see? You tell me your lineup. It has to be the original lineup. But it wouldn't with Tony be, McCarroll on the drums. With Tony McCarroll on the drums. Would you? I would have Alan White. See, but that this this is uh, but as you say, Oasis is seen as the Gallagher brothers. Yeah. Where they've had plenty their wall of sound was created by Tony McCarroll, Bonehead, and Bugsy. I know, but when you watch some of the biggest live performances they ever had, definitely, and you, with Whitey on the drums, with well, Whitey on the drums, with Andy Bell on the bass, with, with Game playing the other. Listen, if the reform, we'll just put Rennie on the drums, right? Edgar Summertime on bass, you know, we'll be fine with that. But Aye. another interesting thing: fifty-five days to record this album, but obviously it'll live forever. To to coin the name of a song that they definitely did inspire. Um, and when when I look at the Stone Roses and I look at uh, lists of all-time great albums, where does it rank in yours? Number one. Number one. And I will always be number one. So the album Forever Changes by Love by the incredible Arthur Lee, um, which so inspired the Stone Roses. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've been pretty open about that. There's a great picture, actually, John Squire, Rennie and Manny, and, and uh, they went to watch Arthur Lee. Was it in Liverpool? I think it was in Liverpool, eh? And did they no bump into the coral in the crowd? There's a great picture. Um, and Ian Brown was doing his solo thing, which he's back on doing now. And the three guys were spotted in the crowd with the coral watching Arthur Lee. I mean, for me, in my lifetime, the Stone Roses is number one. But I've, I've done the retro thing and I've gone back, probably only because they've name-checked yeah, Love. Yeah, well. And, you know, it's always a wrestle between the two albums for me. Stone Roses for me is always going to win because of what it means, of what it changed, of what it triggered creatively in my mind. I mean, I listened to that album every day for a year walking to school. 
Do you still listen to the Stone Roses every day? No. No? No, I don't. No. I probably do. In one way or another. You mentioned Phil's goal. Phil's goal for me was a moment. It was a moment of realisation where it wasn't just about uh, guitar, bass, drums, vocals. The influences that were drenched all over that song then opened your mind really to other genres of music. And just before we came on live, because we are doing this live on Facebook, um, I'll let you hear a soul funk version of Phil's Gold and I would implore everybody who's listening to a Celtic State of Mind, listen to it. It's by Calvin Law. Just fire it into YouTube, download it. Uh, what a song. It sounds as though the Stone Roses have covered that version. Definitely. If somebody would have played that. And that's why we've got Shaft over here. I don't know if anybody has noticed it, but we've got Shaft over at the DJ booth uh, in homage to that version because it wouldn't look out of place as a theme tune, would it? No, no, it's got that. Obviously, the guy was going for the 1970s funk vibe, and he got it. But if somebody would have played that to me and says, we found this uh, in an attic, and we reckon that the Stone Roses covered it, I'd have went, ah, oh, you're probably right, because it sounds that authentic. Remember they tried to do that with Mike Flowers Pops, with yes. Wonderwall. Uh, with Wonderwall, uh, And it wasn't in the time where you could have debunked any rumour online, <laughs> so that a lot of people actually believed that it was a cover. Um, you were talking there earlier about the release date, May 1989, and I remember, I mean, May's always a special date. It's normally when we're playing cup finals, wrapping up league titles, winning European Cups, etc. But I remember that time so, so vividly. Take us back to May 1989 in relation to your Celtic supporting career or life. Just came back off the centenary season, obviously, and that's... And then signed Ian Andrews and Alan Ruff. Yes. Um, yep. That season hadn't, hadn't gone too well, truthfully, but... We were rocking up to Hamden eh, to basically stop Graham Souness's Rangers doing a treble. Yep. Um, we didn't really have much hope, to tell you the truth. The team was not firing on all cylinders. We had Joe Muller playing up front eh, in the couple which of in, games before it. In but, Joe's eh, mind is his position. Which is his position. Yeah. Really interesting hearing David Elliott talk about it was. Talk, about, talk about that period as well when he was on. Mm -hmm. um, so we went to Hamden that day, and this was uh, I remember it visit, going to Hamden that day. It was roasting, roasting hot day. Um, the Bannockburn Celtic Supporters Club bus left early, and where Torrey Glen is now, and no, it's where the Asda is now. Mm -hmm. it used to be a big park, and the buses used to park. You didn't, get a, you didn't get a parking ticket back then, you I do now. used to park up the, the park and everybody bailed out with their carryouts and we had a big game of football. Mm -hmm. uh, then we went in early. That what was, were you wearing that day? What Celtic top were you wearing? Uh, centenary top. Oh, yeah? I was wearing the replica centenary Good. top. Um, so a lot of the guys had the new... Yellow, yeah, away one. That's why yeah, I asked. Yeah, yellow, yep. yellow away one. I never bought that top for some oh, bizarre I reason. I never yeah. got it. Um, it's become a bit of a cult classic. A lot of them. There's a couple of guys that day listen to this podcast. I'm sure there's a picture of Tommy Cummins. I know he listens to this podcast and he's stuck in a rack then. Um, with that top on at that cup final, or either that was a 1990 cup final. Tommy will maybe tweet me and, and it just it was a new jersey at that time. Sort sort me yeah. out with that. But I missed Joe Muller's goal because I was bursting for the toilet. And my dad took me off the crossbar and says, go the now before half time. And I got up the top of the stairs when Joe scored. And we were all jumping about going absolutely mental. And it wasn't until I went back that evening, I've said this before, I didn't realise Derek White had cleared the ball off the line. Mm. I don't think... 90% of the Celtic fans had realised that Derek yeah. White had, had cleared that off the ball. My favourite memory of that cup final, though, is Roy Aiton booting the ball Brilliant. Uh, into the crowd mm -hmm. to waste time. At and a time where ball boys didn't have an endless supply of balls just oh, to throw back in. I know. It, it's one of those moments, and you, and you can see David Cooper, because David Cooper is booked for the free kick, because mm -hmm. did he elbow Peter Grant or... And the sun happened down in the corner, and you can just see David Cooper's face going, yeah. <laughs> as he launches the ball and and he, and he thought is known as the Celtic end at Hamden. What well, a great it's captain Roy Aiken was, though. I mean, fantastic. in that particular game, taking that throw in, Bob Valentine's last game as a referee, 
it wasn't our throwing. He takes it. And that's what creates the goal. That uh, the back pass, the short back pass by Stevens, we Joe nips in. But you, you quite rightly said, Joe Miller, we won our last three games 1 0, and Miller scored the winner in all three games. And the, the away strip, which has become an iconic uh, jersey now, at the time, I think, was much maligned. It was quite psychedelic for the times. It wasn't a classic kind of two tone, whatever. And they had this Space Invaders design on it. And interestingly enough, that jersey obviously was one that people were getting the name of Johnston on the back of it. And I've seen that myself at Love Street, Johnston 9. We had apparently just signed the bold Lee Petit, Merd or Judas. Um, and we all know what happened. But it was just a few days that uh, the Stone Roses album was released just a few days after the Hillsborough Memorial match, uh, Memorial match at Celtic Park as well. So these were the signs of the times uh, around about Celtic. Hillsborough's like a big shadow on that period as well, especially being a football fan. And did the Roses album maybe capture the need for change as well? Um, I know it's not directly linked to Hillsborough, but after Hillsborough, there was a, everybody knew that football had to change. Mm -hmm. The way football fans were treated had to change. And it took years and years, and that's been well, well documented by, by guys more intelligent than me. Uh, but that Hillsborough game, we always just remember the poignancy of that, of that game. And I've told this story before in this podcast about me taking an inflatable crocodile to that Aye. game. Because that was a sort of... A Lacoste croc. Uh, that, that, that was a sort of trend at that time inflatables were took to football I don't, I don't remember I'm still struggling to you know the, the actual connection between a crocodile and Celtic but fair play to you Kevin at that age I and think that, they want to take a banana because inflatable bananas were big at that time they were time. big I remember and, that and I think obviously the Mark Walter stuff and all that taking an inflatable banana so I got an inflatable crocodile and and, and I remember the conversation my dad going like that to me you can't take this to this game it's just so you took it to the game. You never I, bought it outside the game. I took it to the game, right? And we were standing in the queue to get in. You realise this is going out life here, Kevin? Eh? Yes, I'm not You're I'm, happy I'm, to admit this. I'm happy to admit this. Eh? There will probably be guys shouting there, going, "I remember you with that crocodile, you wee idiot." Anyway, I took it to most games. I didn't take it to the cup final, but I took a cro <laughs> inflatable you crocodile. You took an inflatable to crocodile to the games, Kevin. See, I'm, I'm, this is a form of therapy. Fine. It is a form of therapy. Yeah. So, um, aye. And we were standing outside queuing to get in, queuing to get in the West Terrace and or no, the Rangers end, the East Terrace. And, and uh, there was three scousers standing behind me. Mm -hmm. And one of them started talking to me about the crocodile. And my dad went, I tell him not to bring it. And the boy went, How no? My dad went, Well, he says, Look, we want to get back to normality. If that's what the wee laddie takes to the football, let him. Because it's a game of football. Yep. And at that point, I felt completely justified of taking this inflatable crocodile. Did you take it home? Yes. And continue to take it to the games thereafter? Yes, yeah. I did, yes. Good on you, Kevin. Good on you. But I mean, see, when you're looking at the Hillsborough, what I would say, uh, you say people far more educated in the, the subject, uh, maybe politics and policing football games. Uh, I've spoken about it in the past. Just listen to Professor Phil Skaten on a Celtic State of Mind. Definitely. It is definitely the most important podcast we've ever put out with, with Professor Phil Scraton who stays in touch and we had a few wee messages when Liverpool won the league great guy love to get him up here to the studio at some point and we'll do a follow up as well because he's a Celtic man as well mm -hmm. Phil Scraton but it's the only person that you need to listen to about Hillsborough of course aye. once you've heard him on Reddy's book Nothing That's else. Nothing, yeah. else. Nothing else matters. What other music was uh, rattling about your head at that time? Maybe not at that time. You've probably retrospectively gone back to it. Retrospectively, but if you're talking about that time, it's 89. I'm at high school. Um, back to Life. What was the name of that? Soul to Soul. Um, never owned that album in my life, but I, but I know that album because I heard it so many times yeah. at people's houses, kicking about. Friday nights in parks. Uh, another big one, De La Soul, Free Foot High and Rising. Yeah. Uh, that was another massive album that year. Obviously, you're, you're getting married in the Manchester stuff, so I'm picking up a lot of stuff. I'm picking up a lot of the Smiths at that time. Um, John I, Calhoun's favourite band? Yes. Yeah, I've listened to John. Aye. Nice fellow, John for Sterling, same as me. Yep. Um, mentioned my cues. 
fair. My dad will be actually drinking at this precise moment in time. <laughs> uh, but oh, uh, that's where I interviewed Bonehead. Aye, McCuse and Bannerbone. The, the tape needs to come out. Uh, the tape's in the house. The tape needs to come out. Yep. Um, so, De La Soul, uh, Happy Mondays, obviously getting in the Manchester thing and, and that as well. I don't think they had an album out that year, but it would have been Bummed. Bummed. 88, I think Bummed came out. So, you're getting into the stuff like that. Produced by Martin Hannett. Produced by Martin Hanna, eh? So I'm getting into all of that stuff at that point. So, aye, De La Soul and the Stone Roses were the massive two big ones. And I, I, some, and I see the al- albums as linked, vibe-wise. 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 Yeah. And Ian Brown's always had a massive, that's what, that's what I was saying earlier, that Stone Roses album, even though it's like, not classic rock, but it's guitar based. Opened my mind to a whole load of whole load of new, different types of music. Was uh, NWA Straight Outta Compton being heard at that later, time? Later, later on, later I remember at high school, Kevin. I remember it all the time. I remember the lyrical content completely shocking me at that time. Um, and I've gone on to be a big fan of, particularly uh, Dr. Dre, and which surprised John Barnes when I told him afterwards. And I don't know why that would surprise John. Um, another bias. album, potentially unconscious bias, potentially um, a wee bit of prejudice here with regards to my musical taste. I'm allowed to l- listen to Doctor Dre. So, um, Raw Lake Sushi, you know, Cherry, name the big single from that album. A Buffalo Stance. Buffalo Stance. State the, of Mind. The, the high top. State of Mind. Beats. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, check out the lyrics of that. That see, was see, uh, eighty-nine. What you're talking about is uh, where, where, where I stayed. You would be playing football during the summer. And somebody would always have a radio, and it would, the radio would always be on Radio One. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of the chart music at that time resonates with me rather than albums because you listen to the radio on Roadshow when they used to do the roadshows in the seaside towns and that, and they would have Sonia and uh, yeah. and f- people like that. So it, like Beautiful South, I, I've never listened to a Beautiful South album at that time, but I remember. Song for whoever, mm-hmm. massive that year. Mm-hmm. That, uh, that's just like it's probably more singles st- stuck in my mind than than actual albums round about that time. Yeah, but again, if you're going to the youth club or the youth area, as I would call it, or Aye. or um, school discos and that, they're playing singles. So Aye. and then you're listening to the charts at that point. Definitely. So a lot of it, as a younger kid, when you're not buying albums, you're not actually buying music. It was all about the singles, wasn't Ride it? On time with black box. I know. I remember that when I was at Butlins in here uh, on holiday. Now there's a couple of albums I would also mention uh, along with the aforementioned referenced Nina Cherry because the the reason I like Buffalo Stance is the the reference to state of mind in the lyrics. As Ian McCulloch released his um, debut solo album Candleland, but the reason I, I mention it is a friend of the podcast Edgar Summertime Jones played on the follow up album. He played bass for Ian McCulloch on the Mysterio album of 1993. And I spoke to Edgar a number of times about the European and world tour he thereafter went on with McCulloch. And there's a song on that particular album that was a cover. There was a cover song, so keep that in mind for this particular story. So they're in Japan and they get taken to uh, a restaurant. And I don't know why this individual was in Japan, but he was. And the record company had arranged for Ian McCulloch and his band to meet this individual who came along for a meal. And he sat next to Edgar Jones and Edgar Jones thought it was Dustin Hoffman. So he spoke to him all night about his performances in such amazing films like Papillon and Straw Dogs, for example, The Graduate. And the guy looked a bit puzzled, but Edgar thought, you know, he's, he's a film star. He's, you know, he's conversing. He's, he was nice enough and pleasant enough. And it was only when he left that McCulloch started laughing at Edgar. And then he explained that the reason that uh, Leonard Cohen was at the meal was because he had covered Lover, Lover, Lover. So that was a great Edgar Jones story. But I don't know if that was going through his psychedelic stage uh, when they were touring Japan. The other one I would mention is Big Audio Dynamite. Um, who released an album called Mega Top Phoenix? Great album title. Uh, Mick Jones popped up on French TV recently. Somebody posted it on Twitter, and he's wearing that Celtic no, top that you referenced. Celtic top. That no, psychedelic no. Celtic top that you referenced. Why was he wearing it? We've done a bit of digging. We reckon it might have had something to do with the roadie. Um, let's let's find out who was the the tour manager of Big Audio Dynamite. That might answer the question. Might answer the question. Could be a Celtic fan. It might be Mr. Jobson. Who knows? 
at that time. So, yeah, the music, I think, was healthy. Celtic, you felt, um, after stopping the treble at that time, might have gone on to better things the following season. It wasn't to be, unfortunately, Kevin. It was a great summer, though. Mm -hmm. Winning that cup final was fantastic. And, right, we've spoken many a times about what Mo Johnson did. And Why do you keep bringing it back up? I think it's something that I we just need got to the edges. I think it's something that we need to actually itch. I think it's something that we need to ask. We've been itching it though. I, I think we need to ask him. I think we need to ask him. Why did you do it? Well, we know why he did it. Was it money? It was the. Was it money? Was the it thriller ego? in the, the Manila? Wasn't it? Was it? Was it ego? Was it Bill McMurdo? Did he regret it? It looked like he regretted it. Apparently, he doesn't regret it in the slightest. Ah, did make an approach recently. I'm going to put that out there. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't do the deal to get him on. At some point, it might be nice to speak to him. Um, Maybe we should have paid his tax. Well, uh, somebody uh, else somebody else might want to explain at some point what happened with that deal. There's been some suggestions in previous podcasts. Tom Grant, for example, with a Celtic State of Mind, listen to that. There's some very interesting tales that Tom tells about the deal. I, I would ask him straight from the horse's mouth. I've got no problems whatsoever with asking him that question. It's a story. Mm -hmm. And I would want, I mean, right, it was so... Listen, before we, before you, you speak about Mojo, uh, we Morris, we got stick for having Gordon Marshall on a Celtic state of mind. We got stick on uh, Twitter for having Mark Wilson on a Celtic state of mind. Mark Wilson played for Celtic for six years. Gordon Marshall played for Celtic for seven years. Uh, I but, I but, why doesn't Celtic fans like Mark Wilson? Is it the Mark Wilson, the pundit, that they've got an issue with? It's probably the pundit and probably something to do with a legal case that we can't really talk about. Well, we can't talk about it, but other people have commented in public about it. And I think it was well documented as to what uh, happened so in the court case. Mark Wilson played for Celtic for six years. Won numerous titles, numerous cups. He's part of nine in a row, Kim. He won I the first title of the nine. First title, that's right. I've, aye. And by the way, a lovely fella. And I don't mind saying that to anybody. I'm not gaining anything out of that. No. Mark gave us three hours of his time that day, came along to the Jimmy Johnson uh, Academy and spoke passionately about his support of Celtic. It was a dream come true when he signed for Celtic. Definitely. So there's a there's a category of uh, those that we should not speak of. And I mean, I mean, on this podcast, I didn't really subscribe to that. I'll speak to them. I would speak to, to Johnson. I would ask him these questions. Mo Johnson plays a massive part in Celtic's history. Mm -hmm. A massive part in Celtic's current history. If that didn't happen, would we have ousted the old board? Would the the turning, the, the fan revolt had happened? I mean, it's the same with Charlie Nicholas. Charlie Nicholas made a major part in Celtic's history. These guys have got a story to tell. Mm -hmm. And for me, I would want to ask Johnson straight to his face, why did you do it? Mm -hmm. And hopefully, like, the most obvious answer is money, but I reckon ego being the first one maybe had something to do with it at that time, and I reckon he didn't enjoy it. I reckon he regretted it. I do, well, going by there's a quote by David David Hay, mm -hmm. and he says, "I managed Mo Johnson. I could tell when he enjoyed playing football, and he definitely didn't enjoy playing football when he played for Rangers." There would have been a lot of pressure, but you know, when you can live the re rest of your life in virtual anonymity after your playing career is over and because your bank balance is so large, I don't, I honestly don't think it bothers him. I mean, what you've got to remember is we only played for Hearts and Falkirk he after did. that as well. Yeah. And the vitriol that the Celtic fans gave him actually disappeared. Because he became less relevant as because time went on. And we had other things to And you're keeping about. him relevant by continually bringing him up on a podcast, Kevin. Oh, maybe it's just, <laughs> maybe it's my dream guest. Maybe. But that summer, getting back to that summer, mm -hmm. there was a lot of positivity that summer. We signed Jack Anofsky, we signed Dovchek, we signed Paul Elliott. The big man Elliott, yes. So we spent money and on decent players. Decent, decent players. We, so, we signed Mike Galloway. And Mike I, I, Galloway I, I, that's not a throwaway then. comment. We signed Mike Gall Galloway, who'd scored a number of important goals for Hearts, oh, um, not just domestically, but during their brilliant European run. Mm -hmm. uh, the pre what was that season, 88-89, the season we're talking about, they went right to the quarterfinals of the UEFA. They were knocked out by Bayern, Bayern Munich. Munich yeah. uh, if Calhoun had missed that chance that he claims the, the, the goalkeeper had saved, uh, you know they might have still been in the game. But that was a strong side, and Galloway was one of their star performers. 
Definitely. I remember Mike Galloway at that time for Hearts, and he was star man. Mm -hmm. And when we made the signing, I remember being pleased that we had signed Mike Galloway. Yeah. And we, I thought genuinely that he was going to improve the side. Maybe that's just the foolishness of youth. But I genuinely thought Jack Anoski was going to improve the side. I genuinely thought Dovchek was going to improve the side. I think out of the, the names you've mentioned, Elliot was an upgrade. Absolutely no shadow of a doubt. Definitely. I think Dovchek was an upgrade. Definitely. Even on, if you were to compare these players, even to the centenary team, because that was Big Billy's team, right? The centenary team. We're talking a year later, you know? know. You know. So if you're looking for an upgrade, Elliot was an upgrade, Dovchek was an upgrade. Was Mike Galloway? Probably not, no. right? And Jack Anoski looked the part. He didn't have the staying power. If you remove Jack Anoski and that signing, as Morris Johnson, which it was meant to be, then the whole landscape is different. The players that hit 30 at that time as well, Billy Stark, Mark McGee, Roy Aiken, Big Roy, yep. Tommy, Tommy. Tommy, Tommy Burns as well. So it's not like nowadays where 30 is still sometimes looked on as quite young mm -hmm. for a football player. 30 at that time, you were winding your career down. I know. So that maybe came into it and we sold did we sell Aiken quite soon after that? Would it have been? Would it... Roy Aiken, yeah. yeah. And and the problem was losing Roy Aiken and Tommy Burns in quick succession. Mm -hmm. uh, that amount of experience, plus the guys that you've mentioned as well, losing them. And obviously the big one as well, McAvaney, that was a massive loss uh, that we, we lost them earlier on in the season. Um, but yeah, we'll keep trying. We'll keep trying. I've interviewed Charlie Nicholas. I've interviewed David Proven. People that Celtic fans generally don't like. But I've interviewed them because they are part of the history. And I would interview uh, Morris Johnson should the chance arise in these great surroundings of State of Mind Studios. Kevin, it's been a pleasure today talking to you for the first time on a Celtic State of Mind with uh, your uh, Axon Bulletin earlier on today Brilliant. in State of Mind Studios. And obviously this will be a regular thing that we'll do live on Facebook and all other platforms as we master the technology. But all that's left to say for the live audience is thank you for joining us again. Please keep subscribing to us on YouTube and on Spreaker, and we'll be back with you, hopefully, for another bulletin and another podcast within the coming days.